Okay, guys, end of the day. So my thought was, let's just roll up our sleeves and figure out this platform as a service thing. I think we got 30 <laughs> minutes. I think we can do it, no problem. So um, let me, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? I think that's the easiest thing to do. Go ahead. Okay, uh, uh, my name is Suresh, and I work for a company called Orangescape. Orangescape helps people to build uh, business components and expose them as services and then compose those services very freely and then build applications. And we support multi-tenancy at the application level, not at the ISV level. My name's Jared. Uh, I'm the CTO and founder of Tier 3. Tier 3 is a public cloud offering that focuses on mission-critical workloads uh, for the enterprise. And I'm also the creator of the Iron Foundry project, which is the .NET extension on the Cloud Foundry. All right. Am I on? Yeah, mic's on. OK. So, um, I write for TechCrunch, I cover the enterprise, I've been covering the platform as a service market oh, for a few years, went to DeployCon last year, and uh, Chris asked me to uh, moderate this discussion, and I said to him, I'm not sure where to start, and he said, well, why don't you look at this presentation I did, I did a whole look at the, the spectrum of the platform as a service market. And so I wrote a post last week about that, about the abstract, you know, about the platform as a service market, looking at it from, you know, the far left and the visual providers all the way to the to the to the infrastructure as a service on the on the far right. And um, so, you know, I think the post was pretty basic, but there was as aspects of it that people have said, well, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. There's some complexities there. And I was talking with Rich Miller, for instance, over breakfast, and he was you know, talking about how companies are increasingly deploying to multiple clouds. There's kind of overlapping IT policies. There's just lots and lots of issues. You know, James has written about this quite a bit. So what I thought we would do is go through the market. This is how I prepared for this discussion, um, by looking at the post that I wrote. And just going from the far left to the far right and looking at the players in each part of this market, where there might be overlap, the contrast between them. And so by then we'll have everything cleared up, right? Perfect. So if you have any you know, questions or you want to like put in your point of view, this is the time. So um, just from what I've seen and you know, like writing about a lot about application, application development and the enterprise and cloud infrastructures and such, it's that we have reached this pivot point in the, past, in the platform as a service market, where I have actually seen some companies start to say, well, we're actually not a platform as a service anymore. We're more of like a platform, okay? And so I thought that was interesting, um, and that shows to me that there, is some, there are some changes in the marketplace right now. I think you also see it in terms of the ways that after being built, which are much different than ever before. And what is increasingly interesting is obviously the mobile issue, right? Now there's, um, I, I'm talking to startups now who have whole development teams dedicated to mobile, or they'll have a mobile team within a, de within a development group. For instance, Zendesk um, has, a, has a separate uh, mobile development team, and they, and they focus, and they have fo people are focused on iOS apps and Android apps, and you know they don't really cross over, and they just focus on that. Other groups, they'll have teams that they want to be cross-discipline. So this is adding to, I think, to the to the mix here, and it's increasingly complicated because now you have a number of new companies out there, a number of new apps out there, which use multiple services, and they're pulling in data from all these different places. But still, it's very complicated on the back end because the back end doesn't really have any uniformity. And, and so you have companies like Kinvi kind of into the mix. So with that as a context, I did look at Krish's uh, spectrum. And on the far left, he's looked at really the hosted platforms and service providers. But if you look on every space on the spectrum, really what every one of these companies is trying to do is trying to, is, is trying to provide some level of abstraction. So on the far left, you know, the business users get a high degree of abstraction, right? Uh, but primarily they can, you know, they, they can focus on creating their own custom apps or for business processes without having to, to execute on any code. What is it, let's just start there. The, I listed those providers as yourself. 
right. Ornscape and it's force.com. What are the factors there that define this as platform as a service? And what are the contrasts and the overlaps you're seeing with other parts of the market? Uh, Actually, even in that, there is really two distinctive layers, right? Um, they're looking at uh, business users composing simple applications together. They're typically workflow-driven uh, applications, right? When it gets really complex, uh, they need to get something more sophisticated. Uh, that's, that's the pattern that we are seeing. So that's why we have like two offerings. You know, one, we allow people to build business workflows, which is really uh, self-service, business user-focused platform, and then we allow the developers to go and take a SDK and then build the components and compose uh, those applications. So that's what we see, actually. OK. So are there, is there anyone out here who uh, has developed applications on force.com or have people who have done it? Can you tell me about your experiences with that and how you see it as playing into the, into the platform as a service market overall? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just simply, a, obviously, the highest level of abstraction where you've got this tight little sandbox, but at the same time, the usability, UI framework, logging, security, integration, and the guys are free. So you give up a lot, but you get a lot because of that. Right. So what are some of the use cases that you're seeing in, in, these, in, these, in these? Mostly, if I, if I look at uh, the generic foundational paths, they tend to, uh, tend to address the B2C type applications. Uh, when it comes to B2B, multi-tenant B2B applications, I, I see um, a model driven, the metadata level customization and multi-tenancy support becoming very important because when ISV releases a new CRM, for example, uh, there is 100 tenants who are using the CRM application and they've changed some parts of the data model. They added a bunch of parameters, a bunch of workflow rules which are different from uh, what is there in the original application. And then when they release the new version of the CRM, all the tenants needs to get upgraded automatically, right, at the tenant level. And uh, that needs a certain level of abstraction to be able to manage that complexity. So you can't manage that complexity otherwise. Otherwise, you'll simply become uh, some sort of switches people can just turn on, turn off in a SaaS application, which will be like a low end of the SaaS. When you go at the high end of the SaaS, you really need multi-tenancy at the component level that people can manage. So that's what... That's the complexity we're talking about here. I, um, I was actually listening to some of the discussions earlier, and Margaret Dawson um, said on stage, and Kay Clark tweeted it, I don't know if Kay's here, but uh, Kay said, a SaaS built with a pass on, on IaaS, oh, what complex webs we weave, ops with so many vendors. And so, I mean, is that kind of what you're getting at here? Where there's like kind of a looking at multiple infrastructures that you have to play against, or you know, like the apps it's, on one? It's, it's not really multiple infrastructures. You're really getting away from infrastructures and then trying to deal with the business component layer, right? So you're basically saying, do I need, for example, we run on top of App Engine today, and we don't want to manage VMs and then manage their scaling up and scaling down and, and so on. So it's simply, we take our code and put it on App Engine, and it just runs. If there are 10,000 customers who hit the application, it just runs, right? So that sort of simplicity is, and then going up the stack, build those component abstractions and expose them as services, allow our customers to hit them. So that's, that's what we, we are seeing. But, yeah, I mean, for me, this is really all about two, two sides of the playing field. One side, we have operations and that ability around development and them being able to implement, abstract, and create changes without really affecting their customer base and make it so it's very easy to change things, right? They want to upgrade. They want to add new features. They want to add new functionality. They don't want to stop, basically, the train that's already left the station. They want to keep on doing that. So abstraction is very key for them on one side. On the flip side, it's also for that user, right? The user wants experiences where they instantly deploy. They get up and running. They, they don't want to have to understand, oh, I got to upgrade to this next version. I mean, the worst thing you could ever do is actually have an API versioning problem or your application just stops because someone upgrades. Abstraction is going to be one of the biggest keys, especially in this new generation that we have of fast application development. You know, how fast can you launch new technology today is critical for right. people. So the abstraction changes, though, as you move across the spectrum. So you, feel you get further to the center, the abstraction comes with creating more sophisticated apps you know, that have some control over the infrastructure. So yeah. we have the Herokus of the world, the CloudBees, the AppBogs, the Google App Engines. Mm -hmm. 
And so what are, what are the use cases that you're seeing there, you know, and what are you seeing the contrast in that, in that as part of the market? You know, for me around the, the platform or these type of players where they're really application, application vendors, right? They're, they're allowing you to launch your applications, get up and running, be able to have those. The abstraction layer is really how do we automate infrastructure, right? How do we get rid of that operation personnel or make it so that those features are already built in? Those are the keys for them long term. Right now, those are what I would call like core fundamentals for an application developer. The next layer up is where you get into the force.com or um, Orangescape type, type technologies where you're really starting to abstract even the workflow management of it. Right. So are you seeing any overlap you know, from you know, in this part of the market? Not at all, really. It's really business users, and then we move more into the developer-oriented environments. Yeah, it's once you get into the developer market is where you start seeing that abstraction really get a gray area because right. it's going from infrastructure as a service all the way through to a platform as a service layer, which is really just services coupling with really good application uh, hosting. Okay, so um, I can ask the audience a question again. So, um, who out here is a Heroku user? Great. So how do you distinguish the abstraction for yourself when you're using Heroku? What is it about that platform as compared to others that you see as value? And what are you using it to do? Um, I use it for some of my own personal applications, but um, it's kind of easy to get up and going, but gives you a containerized. I mean, it, it, it offers a containerized operating system beneath it. So it allows you to do, you can pull in a little bit more customization on the file system just runs your application, right? Is there overlap that you would like to see? Is it like another platform as a service that you could see using in addition to Heroku that would help you out? Or is, there really just, is it really just Heroku and that just suits your needs? Um, they're probably the easiest and most prevalent with their build packs, which everyone else is kind of migrating to in terms of the way of defining how to deploy an application. Um, there are some pluses to Cloud Foundry's earlier method of managing a curated runtime but at the same time, uh, that can increase complexity where the one time can change out from under you without you knowing. Yeah, and I think. Advantage of Heroku's model. It bundles the binary in with you, so it's not going to change. This is where like the, the major changes are happening, and this is what's great about it. And with these uh, platform as a service vendors, these uh, the app fogs, Heroku's, you know, Tier Three has a web fabric also. Um, every single one of them. It's really they're abstracting that layer, but they're also offering you know the the great schema and metadata to be able to have like build packs or ways of doing deployments a lot easier, so you don't have to worry about it as much. I I honestly believe that a lot of people aren't going to use multiple passes when you get to that layer. They're going to use one. Yeah, That's and they're going to default to it, right? They're going to figure out what that is and they're going to use all that, you know. Uh, and also, there's going to be two different angles. One is there's going to be a bunch of vendors going to give commercial offerings. Uh, it's not open source when I, when I mean commercial, right? And then there is open source uh, of, uh, options. For example, there is going to be Azure and App Engine. I don't ever see there's going to be an open source version of Azure or App Engine. And then there is Cloud Foundry and OpenShift, uh, which is an open source driven uh, platform. So these two things are going to compete against each other. So we're still seeing a delineation here. So we're still seeing that clear delineation, you know, in the spectrum. We have, you know, companies like yours in the far left. And we were moving into more in the center with Roku and the Cloudies and those guys. And you're mm -hmm. saying that companies will just, you know, people just want to use one platform, and that's it. That's the decision that they make. Yeah, they're going to want to do that more often than not. You know, we see this right now when you go into, you know, but, but Amazon does, type. But does a platform cases. like Heroku have the, be, you know, comparable continuous integration, comp com for instance, compared to a Cloudies? And does that make a difference at all, or do they, does it not really matter for them? Can they use other means to do that? Is, is that what they're doing? I think they can use other means, right? But there's also the big point of what are you going to use for your core engine, right? What, what is the primary offering? It's always going to be secondary things that you have. Like, you know, you can start off with a Cloud Foundry-based install or uh, go with a AppFog or a Heroku, but you would also use some type of code integration that you're comfortable with. Those are like secondary items over what you primarily work on. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's look a little, a little further down here. And when we get into more of the, you know, we get into the private uh, platforms to service um, companies, uh, you know, the, the cumulogics of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, 
what is it? What is it distinguishes the private platforms as service providers uh, comparatively then to the Herokus, the Cloud Bees, and the App Bogs? It's just they play into the IT's uh, psychology. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, today IT is not yet ready to go jump onto the public cloud. So, and then there are a bunch of people who are willing to put hands up and then say, "Here we are. We can give you a private cloud." And then uh, they just play play into the psychology, right? So. Uh, and, and on those uh, IT-related, uh, uh, they know how to play that game. So they just wanted to service that market. Now, there's, a, there's a clear market out there for that. Do you think in the next five years that uh, everybody's going to go to the public cloud? <laughs> it's a debatable question. So it's like my take versus yours, right? So, uh, so what's your take? I wish it goes to public. So my vote is for going to public. Mm -hmm. But whether it's going to happen um, lock, uh, lock, stock, and barrel, I don't think so. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be there. There's still going to be some stuff is led in, uh, left in private cloud. I think so. Okay. I, I think so. <laughs> I think it's going to be very hard to move all the workloads that we currently have in IT. There's going to be some, some companies that can go all public cloud. But honestly, when you look at the enterprises today, you know, they're just barely get, dipping their toe in the water in a lot of what we call cloud. You know, for them to be able to move workloads to all public cloud would be extremely hard sure. just because of the security, compliance, the overall cost cost around that and the configure about, you know, how to configure it and maintain it and to be able to build those components or even maintain it in that environment. This is going to be a long haul for them to even look at, you know, going all in on public cloud. I think private cloud, especially like these private PaaS vendors, they're kind of seeing that niche right now and they're attacking it a lot a lot easier for people, and they're using it with open source and being able to provide that right. to them. So the other companies that I listed here in the store included CloudFoundry.com, Apprenda, OpenShift, Uhuru, ActiveState, and Iron Foundry. Mm -hmm. So what, do you, what are some of the use cases you're seeing with Iron Foundry in particular? You know, we're seeing a lot of growth around uh, we're seeing a lot of growth around companies that are right now building platform as a service inside their inside their four walls, trying to get it up and running, and really trying to get uh, their developers to start using that uh, type scenario. And we're seeing it for average workloads. You know, the last panel that we had up here was talking about big data and PaaS and how it combines together. We're seeing um, a lot of people using Cassandra. We're seeing a lot of people use uh, custom applications and building that and using it for scaling and their operational footprint. Um, those are the big things. And when you talk about like Cloud Foundry and the Iron Foundry scenario, we're seeing that on OpenStack, we're seeing it on VMware, we're seeing it on a lot of different hypervisors or even stacks. Okay. Um, I, I, go ahead. I was thinking, I'd probably ask everybody. And also, go ahead. Yeah, please uh, does, do. Does, do you think that PaaS has enabled net new addition of developers because of its simpli simplification? Because I believe that a real disruption, for example, if you take Java, when it came like you know, 15 years ago, it basically erupted and added a lot more developers into the, into the mainstream, right? So why, my, my take is PaaS hasn't done that yet. That's so, my take. So does anybody want to sort of say why it's not done it or uh, meaning, it's not really added you know, another 10, 10 million more developers into the mainstream, right? Or 5 million more developers into the mainstream. I guess that's a really good question about the addition of developers into the, you know, <laughs> to the community. I'm not sure that's a great question, but I know that I've got more developers today than I did 12 months ago, and so because we're building out these platforms, we're going to start pushing them into the mainstream. So can, um, yeah. can you, uh, we didn't quite hear it, actually. Wait, we got to, let me just finish with this. Over, over the last year, we've added 50 developers that we didn't have a year ago because we're, based, we're doing a PaaS-based architecture. What, what so are you using? using? Cloud Foundry. Uh, you're saying it's growing? Yes. Okay. So, so Krish? No, basically, I was looking at the recent uh, events data report, 2012, right? It's, it's probably out there. It says like 20 million, I was looking at the trend, it's growing at 8% year on year growth, developer population worldwide, okay? And it has not changed. So, the, so you need, you're not seeing it at inflection, right? You, know, you really need to say from 8% to 80%, right? Where is that? It's not happening. So, so if you're not being, uh, uh, at the level at which you are kind of 
anticipating, but uh, Facebook.com did bring about that kind of change. A lot of people to contact uh, Facebook. So it was a big wave shift. I mean, uh, they were, I would say, they were, they were quite early in the game, and they did do, do that. I mean, they demonstrated that. Right. You're, you're getting there. <laughs> but yeah. But the question. This is a really simple equation, right? Sure. Which is I have 200 odd people that run what we would call legacy IT today, okay. right? Plus a bunch of outsourced resources. Those two folks are mostly doing great fix and a little bit of application maintenance, right? But they're keeping the shit running, right? <laughs> I have very few developers as a percentage of that population. That's right. I prefer to have 100 active developers delivering new capability for the firm every day, and a tenth of the people that are doing brain fix and running shit. And that's the strategy. Get out of running systems, get to an abstraction level where you don't care about managing VMs and Linux systems and what have you, and that all of your energy is placed on actually writing new capability and delivering value to the organization. So sometimes, cho some, sometimes um, choice is not such a great thing. No, in some, meaning, in some I, my, my take is something like there is a, I see PaaS as a deployment on steroids. Meaning it basically takes the traditional app server problem and then makes it so much more easy for us to do continuous integration and push things into PaaS so that it just sort of runs um, and then scales and we don't have to worry about it. Meaning, does it help you fix a bug? I don't think so because that you go back to traditional development design methodology to fix a bug, right? So, no, yeah, no. So the, but, the, but PaaS is not about that. PaaS is about the human cost. Right. We are eliminating the human cost. He's going out and taking and saying, I have 200 guys that are literally doing break fix and not getting stuff done. Right. PaaS, the whole idea of PaaS from each layer is the human cost, how to eliminate that, how to make people faster. Right now, today, you go and deploy on Google App Engine, you deploy something which probably 10 years ago would right. take your development team twice as long, you would have an operations team, you would have a whole bunch of problems. I'm with you on that. So, <laughs> right. so what are some of, so the, the, in, in, internally, what are the use cases that, you know, for Cloud Foundry inside your company? Well, for, we're a little unusual, because for us it's temporary. <laughs> so what does that include? <laughs> I mean, just everything? That's running an entire global music company on platforms and services. Okay. That's migrating 300 legacy applications from the shit they're running on today to a brand new pass place operating platform over the next few years. It's everything. So what process? To, to, to Jared's point, right? Yeah. You know, because Full disclosure, we have to be a tier three customer. Yeah, I know. Right? Yeah. We do know each other. But the point, Jared's point is absolutely correct, which is we have to get to a level of automation inside the enterprise that we're not going to be able to do that. Right? Right. 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 The deployment of value in days and hours instead of weeks, months, and years has got to be the target. And that, that's certainly what we're focused on. Mm -hmm. All right. I like it. Okay. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's keep moving uh, across the, across the uh, spectrum here. Um, moving more into, uh, you know, the, the DevOps pass environment where, you know, I included companies like Cloudify, and CloudSoft as being the primary players in that part of the spectrum. Is there, what are some of the, what are, what are some of the uh, reasons that you're seeing for this kind of company to have the, you know, in the levels of abstraction? to you, I, I don't know much about it. I have not done a lot with either one of those either. James? Oh, we got four minutes left. He has four questions. You know, I really haven't seen a lot of them. I know that they've talked about doing platform as a service. You know, I've looked at their websites, but I really, haven't seen them in action. Is anyone, uh, any users out here? Go, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. So the general idea of Codify is very similar to, again, what Amazon is doing with Opsport, and uh, in, in which we basically bring the idea of the DevOps notion into pass. And the idea is that, uh, I think, to James uh, Post, which is the composable model, 
rather than having a containerized pass, we could have a composable pass. Right? The composable pass basically takes the concept of uh, recipes for DevOps and allows you to browse the services and compose them rather than having a container that manages the application of the code. In that case, you have more flexibility. So in general, you get more control and more flexibility and therefore have higher diversity of type of application that you can deploy on the cloud. And you leverage things that have already been developed, like shared configuration management tools that are already out there. So, and, and so a little bit more on, so the, the thing with composable versus contextual is sometimes it's always presented as certain either or, but there, there's a spectrum, right? right? Yeah. And so I think Cloud Foundry is a good example of one kind of in the spectrum area where there's a framework aspect of what they do, but a lot of it's about the composability around the framework, and the framework is actually growing. Um, I mean, it's not like it's a, you must do a web application with a 30 second transaction limit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're talking about yeah. what happened right. to me. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's, there's some differences there. That's right. Um, but there is, this is, you know, the question I've been wanting to ask the whole time, maybe this is the panel to ask it to, is, you know, I personally think probably the biggest pass on the market today <laughs> is Jenkins. Because I see way, way, way more companies and, and development teams using Jenkins for deployment. Yeah, yeah. I see Cloud Foundry or any of the other ones that were mentioned. Mm -hmm. now, that's not to say it's the best option on the planet. But people are taking code from GitHub, building it, running the tests on it, using outside tools, supporting it all from Jenkins and pushing it all the way out without having a formal pass environment in place. So there is this kind of, I think there is this, this question, this sort of next generation, quote unquote, um, is is the next generation going to come from, um, you know, I, I personally think there's going to be a bunch of different things, like but, but is the next generation going to come from a, a platform trying to kind of build a block in into those systems? Or is it going to come from an environment where it's, it's the open source community kind of piecing together an ecosystem um, kind of on an on demand basis? And I guess that's, you know, that's a decent question for you guys is, you know, from these, you know, are these the sources of these abstractions really going to be? Uh, about carefully planned architectural abstractions, or are they going to be evolutionary things that come out of the market? Uh. Okay, that's a tough question, but yeah, <laughs> I think it's going to it's going to evolve. I think uh, the the first thing is to move up the stack to be able to do that, right? And there was another question which Alex had. There is this MBAS thing that's evolving. That's also going to merge. In. I see MBAS thing as like one of the use cases of platform as a service specialized for handling mobile backend. That's a sort of higher level of abstraction on top of PaaS. I see a PaaS use case very specialized for mobile backend, but that's going to merge. And, and come back to this component-based uh, abstraction, uh, being able to build applications and compose services and offer value to enterprises as well as for developers. And if you combine open source with that, that's going to be a killer technology. That, that's going to be a killer disruption. Means. Yeah, well, I, Sorry. <laughs> I kind of, I think evolution is the key, right? We're going to evolve the technology over time, but honestly, we're going to evolve it because we don't know what everybody wants still to this day. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that, no one's going to come in and just say, okay, this is what they want, this is how it's going to be, and they're going to integrate that. I think there's a lot of code integration technology. You know, GitHub was, you know, is now becoming a household name for pretty much everybody <laughs> out there. And that was probably never predicted, right? I mean, there was other SourceForge, uh, Microsoft had one called CodePlex, and GitHub just blew it out, right? And we don't know how that's all gonna work, but what's gonna be key is that evolution of taking multiple different systems together and making it one seamless, pr like from development clear to operational functionality, right? That's gonna be the key. And that's the biggest thing that we're seeing right now, especially with customers all they care about is how do we eliminate human cost, right? Or how do we optimize the, that human interaction with systems? Yeah, so um, I think we're gonna have to round it up okay. right at this point. Um, thanks everyone, uh, appreciate your participation. Thanks. Thank you guys.